going to talk about the death of God. Nietzsche declares the death of God. And he does this in the voice of a madman who appears in one of his earlier books called The Gay Science. So the story of the madman is that he, he appears in the marketplace in daylight carrying a lantern. And people say, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for God. I seek God. And uh, the people laugh and say, what? Has he gone missing? Has he got lost? And the madman um, says, no, God is dead and we have killed him. Right? Why? Well, we've become so sophisticated and so self-aware. Uh, our historical knowledge has reached a point where it's impossible to believe in God. And I mean, there are people who still practice religion, but really amongst um, sophisticated people, and not just you know intellectuals, but um, just anybody who's who's um, keeping up with the times, doesn't really believe in God anymore. The madman eventually smashes his lantern and says, "My time isn't right. You people don't realise how enormous this deed is. We have guilt killed God." And we have to figure out how to live now. And people laugh at him, right? Well, Nietzsche doesn't laugh at him. Why not? Well, because this is Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's point through the madman, is that we haven't really thought through what the death of God means. In particular, people are still going around practicing Christian morality. And he's quite rude to uh, George Eliot on this point. I'm not quite sure why he picked her out, but there is this idea, and you find it in all sorts of 19th century um, post-religious movements, that, oh, well, um, you don't have to believe all the awkward bits of Christianity anymore, but you can practice the, the morality because, uh, you know, Jesus was a moral teacher as well as a... Um, as well as the sacrificial lamb of God, <clears throat> Nietzsche says, no, 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 no. If you don't believe the sacrificial lamb of God bit anymore, you don't get the morality. So one of the questions we need to think about is whether that's true. Now, one thing that you do have to appreciate about this is that when he says God, he doesn't just mean the God of religion. He means all the God substitutes that we've invented. So, um, reason. Both in Kant and in Hegel, you have this idea that um, the things that we used to get from God, like uh, moral commandments, actually we get from reason one way or another. So in Kant, um, we get thou shalt nots. It isn't uh, Moses or Jesus who says thou shalt not. Rather, it's reason itself. So if you remember, uh, you apply the tests of reason to your maxims to determine whether they're uh, moral or not. So reason gives you your morality, according to Kant. Well, this depends on a kind of, um, well, transcendental idealism, right? That was Kant's name for it. This too is God, right? So it's not just that we, um, we're we too smart, we're, we're too historically aware, we understand too thoroughly our own historicity. We understand that... Um, Religious narratives are just stories that we've um, allowed ourselves to believe and that we've come to tell each other and that have somehow gained traction, but are ultimately are just culture. It's not just that we understand that about religious stories. We also know that about philosophy, right? So when Kant tells us this comforting story about reason and how reason gives us our ethics, it's not, you know, that too is... God. That too is dead. Hegel tells a story about how uh, human history has a direction to it that ultimately produces a liberal state with free people who understand um, their, 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 uh, their own ethics and are therefore able to practice their own ethics without um, self-deception. Right? That's ultimately the destination of humanity for Hegel well, uh, reason achieves this. So Hegel talks about the cunning of reason. So um, if there's some development which seems to cut against, seems to work against the uh, ultimate destination of humanity, 
the cunning of reason swoops in and somehow turns it to its to reason of purpose. So reason is functioning kind of like God. Wrong, says Nietzsche, this is just a story. Same with um, Plato's forms. If somebody wanted to revive Plato and say, well, um, you know, we don't believe in the Christian hereafter. We don't believe in the life after death of religion. We don't believe in the God of religion. Um, but we believe in the Platonic forms and those tell us how to live. Those supply us with our morality. Well, no, says Nietzsche. The Platonic forms are also transcendence that we've invented. Anything that lies beyond our experience, anything that lies beyond our empirical experience is something that we've invented in order to give order and meaning to our lives. Whether it's uh, the Kantian thing in itself, remember Kant says um, that there's the world that we experience it, the world of colours and shapes and sounds and smells, but then there is the thing in itself, there's a reality beyond our empirical experience that we can't experience directly, but which must be there, and our moral selves are part of that world of real reality. No, says Nietzsche, this is just stuff that Kant's made up. Um, the split level reality you get in Plato, where there's the empirical world, then there's intelligible, then, and then there's the intelligible world. No, says Nietzsche, the intelligible world of Plato, that too is um, invented. And so on. Now, you'll notice that um, what Nietzsche's doing here is uh, resisting any kind of eschatology, resisting any idea that mankind, humanity, has an inevitable destiny and that we are guided there by something, God, reason, um, whatever, um, something transcendent. Now, this is why I said in the previous film um, that there's a... There's a there's a memory of that kind of stuff in the Greek state. I think it disappears from um, Nietzsche's later texts. That's why he's so worried by liberalism and socialism and communism and anarchism and compassion and milky compassion-based morality. Why? Because um, that kind of compassionate culture will mean that we turn aside from the things that Nietzsche values. But of course, there's a deeper problem. Because the death of God means that we don't get stories to underpin our values. We don't get um, stories of transcendence that explain to us why our values are the values we ought to have. So, you can see, nihilism threatens. Nietzsche didn't want to be a nihilist. So Nietzsche says, look, we've killed God. That means we face the problem of working out values of inventing values for ourselves but not just see it's easy to make a list of values that we think we ought to hold the difficult thing is to uh hold them right is to um is to hold them and mean it so that uh they seem to us not like values that we've just chosen but the values that we must hold so at the moment, says Nietzsche, um, we're in this awkward position where we find the remnants of Christian morality compelling. Uh, first of all, that's bad because Christian morality drives us away from greatness. It's also unstable because we've abandoned Christianity and religion and um, everything that that. that underpins we just haven't noticed that yet so as soon as more and more people cop on and realize that the metaphysical basis of our morality is missing then people will lose faith in morality and um, what does that mean well it means that we need to invent some new values and quick and we have to not just invent them but we have to find some way of making them objects of reverence of um, treating them like real values that like as if they had some sort of objective grip on us without 
um, falling back into the kind of um, self-delusion, self-deception, self-deceptive stories that have sustained all our values in all human history so far. That's our dilemma. That's our problem.